39B. It was to be the 10th launch of the Challenger. Mission number STS-51L. Originally scheduled to lift off on the 27th of January, 1986. Now we strapped the six astronauts and the one amazing school teacher into the Challenger. Why I say she was amazing? Well, she beat out 11,000 other school teachers to earn that seat on the Challenger. Over the years, I've had many, many, many school teachers come up to me when I've told this story and say, Mr. Tom, I was one of those 11,000 trying to earn the seat on the Challenger, but Krista McCullough beat me out. Another lady that beat him out was second place winner in that competition named Barbara Morgan. These two school teachers took a leave of absence, NASA paid their wages for a year, and they trained side by side for the Challenger mission. They became inseparable. They became like sisters. If for any reason on the 27th of January, 1986, Sharon Crystal McCullough couldn't have made that launch, Barbara Morgan would have been in that seat. So we strapped the seven astronauts in, six astronauts and one school teacher in, on the 27th of January, 1986, got ready to close the hatch and it wouldn't seal properly. NASA tried and tried. Finally, NASA says, we got to scrub this launch for 24 hours. We took the astronauts and Crystal McCullough out, put them in the astro van, and took them back over to the operation and checkout building where they spent one more night in quarantine. That night, a hard freeze blew into central Florida. It got down to 16 to 18 degrees. 18 degrees, that's unheard of here in central Florida. By the next day, there were icicles on launch pad 39B. NASA sent workers out to break the icicles off, clean up the mess, and the decision was made to launch the Challenger. Now keep in mind, we had never launched a shuttle any colder than 51 degrees. But the rocket scientists had it figured out. They said, look, 31 degrees or above, it's okay to launch. The decision was made to launch the Challenger. I was watching that launch from 12 miles away. I saw ignition and I saw liftoff. Go STS-51L, go Challenger for your 10th mission. Go Sharon Chris McCullough, first teacher in space, go. The Challenger blew up in 73 seconds. Tears just flowed down people's face. How could this happen? The extreme cold had caused that right solid rocket booster to fail. Fire got out, your big orange tank is right there full of 525,000 gallons of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen that blew up like a bomb. After the disaster, Barbara Morgan, who had trained side by side with Chris McCullough, who would have been sitting in that seat if for any reason Chris McCullough couldn't have made that launch, Barbara Morgan would have been in that seat. Barbara Morgan said, you know, she was like a sister to me. Whatever I have to do, whatever it takes, my life's goal from this day forward will be to fulfill Chris McCullough's dream of teacher in space. NASA says, Barbara Morgan, that's very honorable, but it's not going to happen. Why not? Well, we feel like it was a big mistake. We never should have done it in the first place. We're stopping the teacher in space program. There's absolutely no way you could fulfill that dream. Well, maybe one slim chance. What's that, Barbara Morgan says, if you want to become a real astronaut. I'll do it. What do I have to do? Well, ma'am, no offense, but you will have to go back to school and pile up a lot more credentials than you have just to teach school. I can do that. I love school. That's my first love. So not knowing if she would ever, ever, ever get the opportunity to fulfill that dream, Barbara Morgan starts going back to school and taking classes and piling up credentials. And she does that for years and 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 years. 12 years after the Challenger disaster. NASA backs up and does what they said they would never do again. They started up the teacher space program one more time. Barbara Morgan, with all these credentials under her belt right now, Barbara Morgan, the school teacher, throws her name in the hat and is selected. Barbara Morgan, the school teacher, becomes Barbara Morgan, full-fledged astronaut, mission specialist, Barbara Morgan. But it would still be nine more years. Nine more long years. But Barbara Morgan won't give up. She won't quit. She hangs tough. She hangs in there. August the 8th, 2007. Mission number STS-118. The Endeavour is sitting on launch pad 39A. The Endeavour, 
only built to replace the Challenger after the Challenger disaster. August the 8th, 2007, by Closed Circuit TV. I watched them strap the former school teacher, now full-fledged astronaut, mission specialist Barbara Morgan, into the exact same seat on the Endeavor that Chris McCullough had been sitting in on the Challenger. I saw ignition and I saw liftoff. Go STS-118, go Endeavor, go 56-year-old Barbara Morgan, go. This time, with tears of pride and joy flowing down my face, I watched Barbara Morgan make a successful flight to space and back and fulfill Chris McCullough's dream almost 22 years after the Challenger disaster. Now you want to talk relentless pursuit of a dream, you want to talk patience, you want to talk perseverance, then you must be talking about the former school teacher, full-fledged astronaut, mission specialist Barbara Morgan. But guess what? The story doesn't end there. Guess what Barbara Morgan did? After spending almost 22 years of her life to fulfill that dream, she goes to NASA. NASA says, excuse me? You're doing what? She says, I'm retiring. I'm done. I fulfill my dream. I'm done. But Barbara, you're a space-rated astronaut. Your career as an astronaut is just getting started. No. My first love is teaching school, and that's where I'm going. I'm going back to Boise State University in Idaho to teach school. Now, I've met a lot of school teachers over the years. Two on the bus right now. Met a lot of astronauts. I know a lot of astronauts on a first-name basis. Let me tell you something I've decided about both of them. They have the right stuff. The influence a school teacher can have on a young man or young woman is invaluable. Our school teachers have America's future in the palm of their hand. Now, we can understand why Barbara Morgan just would not quit. But why didn't NASA quit? NASA could have thrown the towel in January the 27th, 1967, when we lost three of America's finest, Virgil Ivan, Gus Chris, and Roger Chapman, Ed White on launch pad 34 at 1831, 631 in the afternoon, having trouble communicating with the blockhouse just a thousand feet away. Gus Grissom grabs his radio and he says, you know, if we can't communicate with that blockhouse just a thousand feet away, how are we gonna put a man on the moon? I know we're tired, I know we're hungry, everybody wants to go home. I don't wanna go home, I wanna stay and get these problems worked out. How about you, Ed White? I'm with you, Gus. Roger Chaffee. I'm here for the duration. Let's do this thing. Working late until the evening. Trying to get these problems worked out. On what we call a plugs out test. Plugs out test. There was a spark in a fire in less than 30 seconds. America lost three of the finest. Most astronauts I've talked to over the years at New Gus Grissom will tell you he was the best of the best. Had he not been killed in the Apollo 1 fire, most astronauts believe Gus Grissom would have been the first person to walk on the moon. He was just that good. NASA didn't quit. And NASA says, we're Americans. We're not quitters. We're doers. We're going to do this thing, but we're going to have to make a few changes to this flawed moon capsule. Eighteen months later, NASA had made a few changes. A hundred, five hundred, how about thirteen hundred and forty-one changes. In the process, NASA developed smoke detectors. How many millions and millions of lives have been saved since NASA developed smoke detectors. October 11, 1968, Apollo 7, sitting on the same launch pad 34, where we lost those three astronauts. Don Isel, Wally Schirra, Walter Cunningham, lift off on Apollo 7, on top of a Saturn 1B rocket. And in low Earth orbit, check out this new and improved moon capsule. It's flawless. It's impeccable. To this day, that's the last launch from Pad 34. After that launch, Apollo 7, NASA band, abandoned in place Pad 34. Nothing will be added to, nothing will be taken away from Pad 34. It's going back to dust, however long that takes. The first manned launch from Kennedy Space Center, December 21st, 1968. There were signs all around that said, go for the moon. We're go for the moon. Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, Bill Anders, lift off. Go to the moon. Make 10 orbits. Come home safe. 
Apollo 9, low Earth orbit. More preparation for our first moon landing attempt. Apollo 10, we went to the moon. John Young, Command Service Module Pilot. State of the Command Module called Charlie Brown. Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford. Tom Stafford is here today. Tom Stafford. I met him, got a signature on one of his hats, autograph on one of his hats. Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford get in the lunar module called Snoopy and come down to within nine miles of landing on the moon, not designated as a moon landing attempt. Hook back up with John Young, come back home. But we all know what happened 41 years ago, July the 20th, 1969, at 10.56.15 p.m. With 38-year-old, 5'11", 165-pound Neil Alden Armstrong from Wapakoneta, Ohio, born August 5th, 1930. Climbed down a ladder that had nine steps on it. And with the whole world watching, stepped off that ladder with his left foot. And he put that first human footprint on the moon. Six successful moon landings. Only 12 All-Americans have ever walked on the moon. All 12 left from that one launch pad right there, 39A, where the Discovery is sitting right now. The most historical launch pad in the world, the only place in the world to this day where man left Earth to walk on the moon. Check your seats for all your personal belongings. Don't leave anything on my bus. <laughs>